and it's child custody involved, the drag on for two, three years can go on for up to 10 years and longer. The emotional, mental, physical impact that that has on the father and let alone financial. If you live an incredible life and you are not focusing all your time and energy on what is their mother doing and can you believe she's done that, shift your focus to yourself and what you have control over. Create something interesting. Shift all of that energy instead of what has she done to just like, maybe this is the best thing she's ever done. Today, we are talking about child custody for fathers, and I have an incredible guest joining me, Gary Yunkin. Gary helps fathers reconnect with their children, honestly, from a whole range of really difficult circumstances. And the way that Gary helps these fathers really surprised me. But then I thought, wow, it's so it makes so much sense. And so I am so excited to share that with all of you today, because I think this approach that Gary has to divorce with children, especially for men, especially for fathers, is really revolutionary and really powerful. So, um, Gary, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate the invite, Rachel. Looking forward to you know, answering some questions and just sharing some insights for the men and fathers that are going through, you know, this difficult period and potentially, you know, are seeing some signs of not seeing their kids or the kids are saying some things of not wanting to see them. So uh, absolute pleasure being on, on this uh, interview with you. Um, well, Gary, let's just dive right in. Can, can you tell me a little bit about the mistakes that you see men making when it comes to child custody or, or trying to see their kids during divorce and what are, what are some of the problems that you see happening? Absolutely. So probably one of the biggest things that fathers, when they go through divorce, it's often not fair. And there is this desire that a father wants to see their kids 50% of the time, which feels like the fair and the right thing that should take place. And often in many states in the US and also in Canada and other places in the world, it's not 50-50 where the mother gets the, you know, the kids 60% of the time or 80% of the time. And so then the father starts trying to fight this to try and get to see his, his kids in an even or fair amount. One of the first mistakes that fathers make is when they do get to see their kids and they are going through this, often the children are getting told some things that are taking place during the divorce proceedings. And the father can, you know, if he says anything about the mother during that, like, like the children will say, well, why did you leave mom? Why are you not paying this? Why are you not doing that? And as soon as that father says, what is your mother telling you about this? That is, can be the start of a really, really, really challenging time that that father could go through where those children might start saying, well, I don't want to see you. And it starts reinforcing whatever the mother might be saying about the father's an angry person or he's not doing this, not doing that. Never, ever, ever, ever say anything negative about the mother. Never say anything about her father, her mother, and any other family members at all. No matter how inclined you feel like you want to correct them and correct that situation and educate them on what's taking place, do not do that. So that's number one. Don't, don't say anything negative about, about, about the mother. It's hard, extremely hard. <laughs> yeah, I can, I mean, gosh, I know from a lot of my clients, right, that especially when she can be so aggressive and attacking and negative, and you know she's saying these things to your children about you, so hard to set that aside. Um, Gary, can you, you've talked to me before about the, you know, keeping in mind that it's the child's mother, right, and how important the security of that relationship is to the child. Can, can you talk about that a little bit and maybe help? Um, how, how do you help your clients do that? How do they set aside the need to fight back, the need to defend themselves or to criticize the mother? Uh, how can understanding maybe that relationship between the mother and the child make it easier to actually do it? Yeah, I mean, a, a child's connection to both parents is extremely primal. And, you know, like that first point of mind saying anything negative about the mother is going to push that child closer towards that other parent or, you know, push it away from you more like it. Um, it is a 
like I was saying, a very primal thing. It's to just nurture however it is. If if the child is, is saying some things, you know, of even, you know, one father has had a situation with a child where the child has felt like they have to love one parent or the other. And a great example that this father gave to that child was, it's okay to love both hamburgers and pizza. You know, you can love both of them. You know, you can love both your mom and your dad. You don't have to choose. And so it's the same thing of, you know, your feeling of where you might be the better parent in your eyes and you might have better rules and that child spending time with you might be a better situation for that child. And so, but trying to convince that child of what the mother is and how bad the mother is and that you are the better parent is just going to push that child away from you. It's not going to do you any favors. So just, those are just some very, very basic things. If the fathers just follow that as the initial thing, I mean, there are so many layers to this, but that alone is just going to really start helping them. Just don't try and teach them on what the mother is doing. You just be the example. You lead your life, life in the healthiest possible way by leading through your own example and allowing them to see through that example is going to be the best way to change their child's mind or I call it creating a gravitational force in your life. Create a movie that your children will want to be a part of. And that is, is such a beautiful way of, of navigating this. And you're going to have fun doing it. If you live an incredible life and you are not focusing all your time and energy on what is their mother doing? And can you believe she's done that? Shift your focus to yourself and what you have control over unbelievable shift that will start taking place and you'll see a change in your children's life as well i i love that like making yourself kind of this gravitational force that your children want to engage with um, as you're describing that kind of feeling and creating that it brings to mind a few clients i've worked with who who are actually really good at that part um, and have had the experience that their kids really want to spend time with them and love spending time with them but either the moms or the courts or often both of them together are keeping the kids away from the father, even though the kids want to see them. And I, I've got one in particular coming to mind who, you know, the kids are so upset when they have to go back to mom's house. Um, and he, I, you know, I think a lot of these men get really caught up in the legal battle, right? And end up spending thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to fight not just to be able to see their kids, but feeling like their kids really want to see them and aren't able to. Um, what would you say to, to someone in that position? Well, having now worked with and spoken to over 400 fathers, I've seen the trends and patterns of fathers. And that's one of the questions that I always ask them in terms of, tell me about the legal route that you've gone, gone through, you know, on the custody battle, how long has it taken place and how much have you spent? And, you know, on average, these, you know, when it's child custody involved and trying to prove, especially with what I work with on the alienation sort of side, it can drag on for two, three years, can go on for up to 10 years and longer. And so you imagine the impact that that has on, well, let's start with just the father, the emotional, mental, physical impact that that has on the father and let alone financial the lowest of father that is broken, doesn't have any money, will be spending $10,000 is how much the lawyers are going to ask for, going up to hundreds of thousands. I've had a father spend a million and a half over seven years. Another father spent seven million. Out of all of these fathers, it is one thing that they don't realize is that a judge cannot get your children or force your children to love you. And this is one of those things that they don't realize that the when a court case goes on for three years, it is humanly impossible for a mother to not speak about some of that, to allow it. So I call it almost like a pregnant mother, whatever she drinks or eats, a portion of that goes through to the fetus. And the same for what takes place when there's court. It's a portion of that goes through to the children. And then the outcome of what the father is feels like going through court is the only option to prove to the children that he's not a deadbeat dad and hasn't given up on his children. But what ends up getting passed on to the children is this message is that dad is trying to take me away from you. That is why he's going to court, not that he loves you. 
And so you just combine all of these together, all of those, those elements, and just through this force, and the more that you try and force and gather all this evidence, you imagine of what, uh, I'll give you another example here to try and explain this. You walk in a jungle and you come across a tiger. It's often going to just run away because it's got a space to run away. You put that same tiger in a, jungle, in a cage, you step into that cage, you're going to see claws. It's going to attack you. The same, a woman that is already, things are not great and that you've ended up in that divorce. And you now go start gathering this evidence of what a bad mother she is and why you should have custody of her or increased custody, whatever it is. You start seeing a worse and worse side. You start seeing that tiger's claws. So you combine all of these together and all of that force. And eventually after three years and you do get that 50-50, you're going to suddenly get these stories of, I don't want to see you, dad. And they will not tell you why. And that is devastating. Like, I can't tell you what that does to a father's mind, where a child that is in the teenager or even preteen telling this father that their, their father had a beautiful relationship with their son and daughter, for them to say, I don't want to see you now and won't tell you why, that destroys a father's mind. He cannot focus on anything in life. His life spirals down. And if he doesn't get support from somebody like you or from an organization like mine, his life would just spiral down and down and down. Gary, you've had some personal experience with this in addition to the hundreds of men you've worked with. Um, is that something you are interested in sharing a little bit about your own journey with, with your children? Uh, absolutely. I'm very happy to because it's the difficult time that I went when my sons were nine years old and 12 years old. I lost them for three years. And a large portion of why I lost them was just I didn't have the language to be able to deal with the chaos of what they were experiencing. And I didn't know how to deal with it myself. And so my life just collapsed. And along with that collapsing, my, I didn't get to see my kids. Well, my life collapsed as a result of not seeing my kids for three years. That first year was horrendous. I ended up in a hospital. Uh, my health was terrible. My Just so many parts of my life just collapsed over just thinking about my kids 24 hours a day. And... But looking back at it now, it was one of the biggest gifts that has ever taken place in my life, where the relationship I have with my sons now, who are now, my youngest son is about to turn 18, and my oldest son is 20. And I have a beautiful relationship with them now. You know, it's been four and a half years reunited with them. And the result of this is I've started an organization called 100K Fathers, which guides fathers through exactly this, to either the early stages of it, of seeing the signs of their kids saying, I don't want to see you, two fathers who haven't seen their kids for many years to over a decade. And I'll go into detail, if you like, of how I actually help or how we actually help those fathers. Yeah, Gary, I, I think that would be great because I, I can hear there's so much passion, <laughs> right? Especially when you talk about what can happen and that, you know, I can see it so clearly from some of the clients I've worked with that my kids love me. I have this amazing relationship. I want to work with them. And they do fight and put so much into fighting. And then to hear that where that can lead, right, is actually to you know, so far from what you wanted. Um, so, yes, please um, tell us a little more about 100K Fathers and how do you actually, because this is also, it's a big thing to let go of the fighting, right, to let go of fighting for your kids. So, yeah, please, um, how do you help fathers do that? Absolutely. Well, first thing for fathers going through this when their kids don't want to see them, fathers can feel very alone and they can feel a hell of a lot of shame. So just being part of a community and organization like 100K Fathers, they're not alone. They don't need to explain to them, well, why don't your kids want to see you? You know, that's a very difficult thing for a father that's got teen, teenage daughters. Well, why, don't, why doesn't your, father, your, your daughters want to see you? What is it that you've done? There's always that question in the back of people's minds. And as it is, men don't generally speak about what's going on in their lives and even less when something like this takes place. So it becomes a very alone journey that they go through filled with a lot of shame and regretful. They, they're stuck in an eternal cycle of mistakes that they feel like they've made. As part of being part of 100K Fathers, it's not about being the victim. It's not complaining about what your ex-wife has done and cannot believe she's done this to me and just keep telling that his story over and over, hoping that that's going to help and change. That doesn't change anything. 
this is about starting with the very core of the father, his stories and his beliefs and shifting those. And when you start changing those and start raising that father above what's taking place within his life, like a bird's eye view level and even higher, he's able to start letting go of the suffering he's going through, the pain, this feeling in the back of his mind that my children are suffering without me being there. They are going to be turning out, you know, it's going to be damaging for them for the rest of their lives. And just understanding that they've got to focus on what they have the most control over. They don't have control over the judges, the lawyers, the mother and their kids, as much as they don't have control over so many other things within life. What they do have control over is themselves. And that's what this focus is, is nurturing that father, building the pillars of his life, the mind, the body, relationships, income, allowing those to be very deep roots in their father's life, that whatever storms that come up, he's able to endure those storms. And part of joining 100K is preparing that father for that time when he has any interactions with his children. Might be at that early stages and he's still seeing his kids or later stages where it's been a couple of months or years. And that child, that child reaches out to that father or there's a meeting that's been set up. Most often that father isn't ready for that interaction. He's got all this anger built up inside of him and it's like a volcano that will erupt if that child says something that that child shouldn't be hearing from the mother and the questions that will come through. So if that father isn't ready for this and nurtured internally and ripped out those old faulty foundations, beliefs and stories, that father's going to say something that could result in that father not getting to see that child again for another 10 years. So this is absolutely critical to be ready for those interactions and to be in a healthy place. So children are incredibly perceptive of where a father is at and their emotions. And you can fake it and you can pretend that you're good, but they will pick up that something is wrong there. So in a nut, quick nutshell, that, that is, is what is, you know, in terms of what it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I know you work so much, Gary, with a lot of fathers who, you know, really have been separated and apart from their kids. But as you're describing this, it's so applicable for fathers that do have custody. Absolutely. Because I know a lot of men, especially early on, you know, their ex-wife, maybe the divorce isn't even finalized yet. She has a new partner. The kids are coming to dad's house and, oh, mom's new boyfriend bought me this bike or took me here. It's so fun, right? Or they make some comment, you know, about, oh, mom's engaged and dad didn't, you know, like there's so many triggers. And I do talk to a lot of men who are like, it's not, you know, I, I can't take anything out of my kid. Like I need to be in control of what I feel, but it, it is that volcano that they can't stop, right? It's like, oh my gosh. Um, you talk about kind of changing that, that base level story. Um, I know there's a lot to that, and that's really probably beyond the scope of what we can do for someone, right, with this video. But could you give us maybe one or two pieces of that process? What is something that somebody's is maybe just watching this? Is there like a first step they could take to do, changing their own story? Absolutely. Uh, the best way is to by telling a story to explain what the story is and how stories hold humans together entire society together is through or as a result of stories i'll start off with the first one in this incredible book by it's called sapiens by yuval noah and he talks and i'm just shortening you know the way he describes this but talks about a chimpanzee that's able to make a sound and that's for an eagle and the chimps will run under a tree another sound and that's for a lion and they'll run up that tree but humans are the only creatures that can say yesterday i saw a lion at the bend of in the river Let's meet tomorrow at the big oak tree and decide what we're going to do. You can put 60,000 humans together in a stadium watching four people play musical instruments and everybody's cool with that. But you cannot put more than 150 chimps together before they will start killing each other because there's no story holding them together. It's the same story that allows people to become doctors, lawyers, to become school teachers, to follow the story within life. But it's when that story breaks that we get this pain and this expectation of how things should be, then we receive the suffering. And I can explain this a little bit further where I spent 
a month in the Amazon jungle with a tribe of hunters and gatherers in Ecuador, deep, deep, deep in the jungle. And because they live purely off the jungle, life there is extremely difficult. And they live the way our ancestors used to live a few thousand years ago, where the girls that are within their tribe, when they reach an age of 12, 13 years old, they get married off and they you know, either marry somebody in their tribe or a tribe further away. And they then leave that family household. Sometimes that mother and father never get to see that child ever again. And according to those parents, they are successful never seeing that child again. And the rest of the tribe looks at that family as, and that father as extremely successful. But in modern day society, if you don't get to see your daughter from 13 and you see other fathers with their daughters, you receive that pain. It's only because that's the story that we live to. So you can see just by shifting that story, understand that it's a story that's giving you your pain and suffering. So I'll give you one more great short example here where I look outside my apartment here and there's these trees that drops, drop these hundreds and thousands of these blue little berries. And these birds come and eat those berries and they fly away with them. You can imagine if that was a conscious tree on how angry it could be that that bird has taken its children away where instead of it getting to see that seed drop to the ground and that growing into a sapling and into a big tree, it doesn't get to do that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't get to see what's happening with that bird flying away with that seed, that it's carrying it away to more fertile grounds, and it actually drops that with some shit that's going to help it to live its life. But the same thing when these fathers aren't getting to see their kids, they don't understand the lessons that they're learning in life. Suffering is a part of life. You cannot remove suffering from life. And if you don't get that suffering early on in life, you're going to receive that later in life, but you're not going to be equipped to deal with that suffering. So sometimes there are gifts in this of you not being there with those kids that the time away from you is going to prepare them for, you imagine if they crash their first car, lose their first job first breakup is not going to be anywhere near as painful as not seeing their dad. So it's not going to be catastrophic in their life. So these are just stories that you can just see by shifting their perception, shifting their stories and their beliefs of what's happening can allow them to get, let go of that pain, that suffering and allow to let go of that pressure that's inside of them, like the volcano that allows them to look at this as being a little gift in their life that changes everything. I, I love that piece that's been coming up for me a lot from different clients is finding the good, right? finding the gift in what's happening. And you're talking about not just finding the gift for you, right? And for you, it was, if you hadn't gotten to that low point, you wouldn't be here, <laughs> my goodness. Um, but also the gift for your children. Um, Gary, are you, one thing that does come to my mind and that I know a lot of um, men I talk to worry about is, you know, the more you kind of dive into statistics and um, attachment science and, you know, this, how children form secure or anxious attachment styles. And there's so many statistics out there about children of divorce and in separate homes have being more likely to suffer from ADD or not do well at school, not make much money, go to jail, right? There's all this kind of frightening data out there that says, hey, you know, it actually isn't good for kids. Um, and so I, I love, and I can see so many of these alternate stories. But one thing that I do hear from a lot of men is like, but here's this evidence, right? That this story that I'm afraid of might actually be the right one. Um, how do you help people navigate some of that? Especially, there's so many scary things on the internet if you Google divorce with kids, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I can't talk for every situation, but I've experienced enough situations here to realize that maybe, and, and as, as I'm talking about this, I'm realizing maybe there's a connection here between this evidence and what the tr majority of the path, 99% of the path is go through divorce court to be and fight this over in custody. And so because those battles take two or three years and longer, how, what kind of environment is that creating for the mother looking after those kids and the way that mother feels about the father of those kids and then how does that roll over onto the children and so is this because of the divorce 
and what's taking place there, that that statistic is actually taking place where these kids are getting damaged because the father's not there. And because you're going through such a situation on how angry and naturally that as divorce takes those three years and it costs both sides an enormous amount, time, financially, emotionally, mentally, etc. How angry that that mother must be become towards that father and then starts not saying positive things about the father when the child is going to go and see the, the, the father. Does she make it easy or does she make it hard? Does she drop little negative seeds into that child's mind because she's feeling angry? She's the volcano as well, erupting into that child's life. So going this alternative path, you know, and I cannot advise, we, we don't give any legal advice or support. And whatever your choice is yours going that route. But for those fathers that are pursuing this and trying to force through that situation because they feel they don't have an alternative option, because they are fearful of what that data is, just to know, like, look after yourself during this time. Heal yourself. Be a better person if there's those crossroads of fighting this and being angry and, and taking your ex down over this or trying to take those children away, whatever the situation is, just look to yourself first, heal yourself first, get yourself to the best situation. When your children come around to you, have an environment that's healthy for those children. Focus on what you can do. I think it's called parallel parenting where you might not have the same rules as what the mother does, but in when the children come around to your house, Make that the best possible environment possible. Never talk about what's taking place between you and the mother. And if, you know, if the child ever says anything about you and, and, and the mother, just say, you know, of, of have, having the kids or whatever it is. It's just like, we loved, I loved your mother when we had, had you, you know, and that's why we had you. And that's as the sum total of what it should be of what you should say. So, yeah, maybe it could be influencing that data going through this terrible court system. And I, that makes so much sense to me, right? We tend to look at, well, you know, this is happening. And so divorce is the problem, but is there something between the divorce and these statistics? And you're saying, yeah, a lot of times there's a two or three year nasty custody battle where both parents are just kind of pushed to their limits, mentally, emotionally, financially, physically. Um, what kind of environment does that create for kids? And and in that really suggests such, and I, I think this is really what you're doing, right? And 100K Fathers is such a massive mindset shift around divorce that it's not this battle between you and your ex, but that it needs to be really regardless of whether you're married or not, if you have kids, you're still on the same team. And somehow you have to find a way to see her as a teammate, and if she's not healthy and she doesn't feel good, then the, the kids are going to suffer from that. Um. Absolutely. Uh, I'd love to just add to this uh, from seeing it now from both sides. There's a father that, that I've worked with who's reunited with all three of his kids. And for about a year and a half, so a fairly short amount of time in comparison to some of the fathers that I work with that he didn't get to see his daughter. And the situation was so bad that that little girl kept asking, where's dad, where's dad, that the mother said, your father's died. And <laughs> so can you imagine? And so this father was just very restricted in being able to see that um, little daughter. But eventually, through working with 100K Fathers, he just put down that anger and started working on himself and really started shifting so many things inside of him that he then found the language to be able to approach her and say, you know what, I know that this must have been so difficult and that you've, you're struggling through this. I just want to support our little daughter together. Is there anything that you need? I'll send you a little bit of money. I just want to make sure she's been looked after. About four months later, is there any way that I could come and see my daughter? I've missed her so much. He ended up coming to see her. And fortunately, he didn't listen to what other people were telling him. Well, you've got to fight this through court. He had all the papers ready to go through court. And after a few months of reuniting with his daughter, the mother of that little daughter said, thank goodness you didn't go through court because my mother, the granddaughter of this little, little child was going to sell her two and a half million dollar house to make sure this father never, ever got to see that child again if he fought this in, in court. Uh, so 
So instead, that mother has flown that daughter to go and see the grandparents for the very first time under her own desire, like bringing that child to the grandparents. That little daughter is now reunited with her older little brother and her older sister for the first time. And that father is now, it's two different mothers. So this is as difficult as it gets, you know, where you've got not only one battle you're fighting, you're fighting two. He applied that same thing with the other two kids. And that father now, and a beautiful little story with that six-year-old son, taught the son how to pee standing up because he had been raised by the mother and by the daughter. And when he took this, you know, had time with his little son, took him to the toilet in, at a baseball match, and he went to go and pee standing up. And the kid thought, <laughs> this was the biggest superpower ever. And so these are the stories among so many other stories. And father that I just started working with, three little daughters going through such struggles and fight and force to just working with him and working with that core and his stories and beliefs that suddenly things just start opening up for him and the relationship with his his little daughters where all three daughters now are so happily wanting to see him the one daughter that would he would normally take each daughter for the birthday and go to something special his 14 year old daughter said no nope, i don't want to see you a couple of months back to now dad i'd actually like to go and go away camping with you and the father has actually got to see their daughters on days that it is the mother's custody because he's not going through force he's going through a completely different approach there are stories after stories on how many fathers have reunited with their kids and have started healing that relationship instead of just like i'll never talk ever with my ex-wife ever again like with me, with my ex-wife, from being so toxic and bad place to now we're able to co-parent in such a beautiful way. We have hour-long conversations talking about the kids and what she's getting up into her life and what I'm getting up in my life. And she's comfortably happy that my kids are coming to see me and that they've got a relationship with my girlfriend. It is phenomenal, different approach to what most fathers go through when they go through this. Yeah, I mean, uh, this shift away from fighting, right? I mean, I think this is just such a profound change in the approach to child custody, really to just divorcing, separating with kids in general. Um, Gary, I know a lot of the men that I talk to are in pretty early stages. And a lot of times it's a divorce they did not want, right? And so there's there are so many levels of anger, frustration, resentment, regret. Um, they have feel so many things towards their ex or soon to be ex. And the other piece that I hear and that I get a lot of questions from them are, why is she doing this? And not just why is she divorcing me, but why is she being so mean about it? Right? And that there's so much aggression coming from her. And I see them get caught in this cycle of fighting. Right? And what you're talking about is these guys stepping out of that cycle and when they really step out of it that she does too and now suddenly there's there's no more fighting but i i get a lot of guys who are like i don't understand why she's being so aggressive and i, I wonder if you could speak to the why especially for a lot of these guys like if she's trying to keep my kids away why is she doing this because i think that's a source of a lot of the anger is that they feel so attacked Right? And then that desire to fight back is such a natural response. Um. Absolutely. So why, I mean, there, there can be a, a thousand whys, an infinite amount of why she might be doing that. And, you know, depending if it's been one year of marriage or 10 or 15 years of marriage, and she might feel like you've torn the family apart. Even if she's done that in the back of her mind is, well, well, if you were a better husband, I would have not had to have separated from you or left you. If you would have provided better, if you would have been more of a man, if you've done this, done that, who knows the infinite reasons why she's actually done that. But I just want to talk to these fathers. It's the same thing that I see this as being a gift for a father to lose his kids because it's a fire that rips through your life that you don't have necessarily control over, but it's what you're going to do with that. It's like after fire, if there's been some rain four months later, you're going to see all these green shoots, all this new life that's going to come out of that life. But if you keep focusing on what's taking place here, you almost stop those green shoots from, from shooting, from growing. And so 
this is the second phase of your life. Like, I can't tell you how I'm excited I am for you because my life, like I got divorced when I think I was about 36. I lost my kids at about 40 and now I'm 47. And my life just gets better and better and better and better. Like I'm getting younger and younger and like I'm my, all pillars, all areas of my life are, are getting nurtured and enriched and healthier and stronger. But it's because I haven't been focusing on what is lacking, what has been removed out of my life. Instead of focused on what am I going to do with this gift? How am I going to spend my time? Like, you know how great it is having now an extra 50% of your time if you've only got a 50-50 custody with your kids or even to look at it, I've only got my kids 20% of the time. Well, what are you going to do with that 80% of that time? Versus before, you would have to be waking up early, making the kids sandwiches and breakfast, taking them off to school, doing homework with them, you know, whatever, is, making sure they brush their teeth. You don't need to do that now. That is not your responsibility because you can't do that. What are you going to do with that time? What hobbies are you going to get into? How are you going to nurture the new relationship you're going to be in? Before you jump into that relationship, heal yourself, get yourself to a better place, create an interesting movie for another woman to become a part of, want to become a part of, and then build the social circle of friends that when you are with your kids, there are all these other friends that are in your life and your kids look up to you. It's like, damn, dad is so popular. He's doing all these cool things. He's going off and he's doing a little, a little 10 mile run. He's going rowing. He's doing, going mountain climbing, rock climbing. He's doing this, doing that. He's involved in this thing, involved in that. It's, create something interesting shift all of that energy instead of what has she done to just like maybe this is the best thing she's ever done and she's pushed you and it was that big push you needed in your life to truly find yourself and this isn't a midlife crisis this is truly stepping into the second phase of your life you've now got all this wisdom you can tap into you've you know if you haven't been gone through the court which would destroy you financially You've at least got financial finances start going doing some of these things. Just shift what you're focusing and where you're putting your time and your energy. Yeah, I mean, that shift in focus is so massive, right? Because I think it's so common in this kind of coaching work to talk about what you can control and what you can't. But so much of this is so much of divorce is getting caught up in the need to control all of those things that you can't. And you're saying, what if you just really radically accept it, right? And embrace it and celebrate it and look for what, what is the opportunity? Um, yeah. Absolutely. And just to add on to that is that so many people feel like I've lost my soulmate and I've like, I'll never find somebody else like this person. Yeah. There are 7 billion people on this planet. Believe me, there are so many beautiful people that are beautiful hearts, souls, that will respect you, that will honor you, that will cherish you, that will walk this journey with you. And you will only be able to see that because you are not a fortune teller, but you're not going to find that person. You're not going to be able to hold on to that person. If when you do meet that person, you are this angry person talking about what your ex has done. That's not attractive in any shape or form. But if you are talking about, man, I can't be, I just did this quarter marathon the other day and I'm going hiking up into the mountains with some friends and I'm building this house at, at you know, this, this children's home and I'm doing this. And she's like, who the hell are you? I want to be part of this movie. It's like, then you'll be, when you meet that person and you will see the way that that person responds to your life. And even for women that are going and watching this, there are going might be some women that the same thing applies is to just realize you will in the future, your future version of you is smiling right now. If you take this action, if you let go of this anger that you have towards your ex-wife and look at this being a gift, you can shift the trajectory of your life. And then you'll see when you're with that person, you're like, <laughs> thank you, ex-wife, for being so <laughs> shitty, for doing this, for doing that, for being so nasty, for doing you will be so, so eternally grateful for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought up that part, Gary, because the, the two things that I often hear, one is for a lot of men, if you've been married for 30 years, 40 years, and maybe you met her when you were 18 or 20, and it's been, it can be so hard to even imagine 
that there's another person out there that you could connect with. And then also, I think there's that soulmate piece. Right? Well, she's so special. Right? There's, there's not going to be anyone like her. Or then like the other real extreme is I thought she was so special and look how awful she's being. So no one is special, right? And no women could ever possibly be. But when you get stuck in any of those belief systems, not only are you not really attractive to those people when you meet them, but I think so often you don't meet them because you're staying in such a limited world and in such a dark world, really emotionally. Whereas what you're talking about is going out and finding these these things, these adventures, these projects, these purposes that you love, which are naturally going to move you into all kinds of different situations where you're going to meet very different kinds of people maybe than you ever have in your life. Um, and I, I do think we all just live in such a necessarily limited universe of our own experience. And it's easy to forget that there's, none of us can experience the entirety of, of what it is to be human. There's 7 billion people on the planet, right? Maybe close to eight right now. <laughs> and I'll just add to that. Can you imagine you spend three years of your life focusing on gathering evidence and preparing for court and doing all of that as opposed to, so every weekend and every time you've got to spare time at night, you preparing for this court and gathering this evidence which is what so many men do, as opposed to spending three years of your life going out and discovering yourself, discovering these new hobbies, giving of your time strengthening your body, going to the gym, eating healthily, doing all of those things. What kind of man are you going to be in three years time of who that, who you're going to attract into your life? And when you do go out there, if you're at a coffee shop, wherever you meet at a wedding or whatever it is, you meet that person or a, another woman, look at those two different people, that conversation you're going to have, it's completely different. So just shift where you give your time and where you put your energy and where you put your focus and you're either harming your future version of yourself or you're helping you know uh, it's it's and one last thing to adding to this of somebody who said that i was married for 40 years i can't start again my grand got met a man at, in her 80s and lived with this this man so incredibly happy you know until they, they both passed away so there is never too late to be able to meet another soulmate, <laughs> you know? So that is just a story again, that you've yeah. told yourself and that you believe and it's reinforced because you're not getting out there. And so you're not, you're spending all of that time focusing on the legal work and gathering evidence since you're not going mountain biking and hiking and whatever it else, where you're going to meet those cool people that have got the same interests as you. I love the, yeah, I said 80 even, right? Meeting somebody. I, I've seen a couple of those stories online too of, you know, the woman I was with for 50 years passed away in our 70s and two years later, I remarried, right? So. Um, but you have to be available for that, right? Otherwise, you're not going to look for it. It's not going to happen and you're going to miss those opportunities. Yeah. The piece that I love too is just it's as you, you know, talk about this recreating yourself and shifting your focus. It's also so clear in those two versions, right? If you spend the three years fighting and pouring everything into this and all of your money, all of your energy, all of your emotions versus creating yourself intentionally, finding yourself, not just for future partners, but it's just so clear how that has to have a completely different impact on your children. And I, I think it's so easy to forget that your kids, like taking care of yourself is taking care of your kids. And so often I think people give up and sacrifice what they need in the interest of their kids. And they don't, they forget that that is actually, you know, if you're not taking care of you, you're not taking care of your kids. So you just, you can't, you're not there emotionally uh, the same way you could be. Absolutely. And, and this is where you can provide a nurturing environment for those kids. So if you feel, ah, oh, my kids are getting damaged by my ex-wife and I should have custody or, you know, I, you, whatever the story is there, but create an environment where you are doing healthy things with the kids. If you don't have energy and all your energy is like you've spent till 12 o'clock every night during the week on your legal cases, because on the weekends you get to see your kids, how much energy are you going to have for them? So as opposed to, and then because you've got no energy, you're not going to think of 
great ideas to do with them. So instead, they're going to be watching Netflix on their devices, as opposed to you're going to have planned a cool little picnic where you go out to the shops and you go in with your little daughters choosing little items for the picnic and you take the little blanket and the basket out to the lake or to some river and you have that beautiful time. They take their shoes off and they go and explore and connect with nature. What kind of nurturing experience are you creating for your children? Because you are nurtured yourself. You have the energy and the willpower and the desire to be able to do that. Yeah. So it, it's not complicated. This. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you, you know, talk about it, it's so simple, right? Because so many men are out there fighting this custody case to prove to their kids that they're not giving up on them. Yes. Right? It's like, I, I want, they're doing it because they want their kids to know they love them, but it leaves them with no energy to really love them in ways that are meaningful in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Gary, you mentioned pillars, all the pillars of your life. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the pillars that you you work with and, and that you teach to your clients in, in the 100K community? Absolutely. So the four core pillars are the mind, body, relationships, and income. So this is almost like a four-legged chair or stool, where if you remove one of those legs, that chair is going to fall over. So, and I've seen that with the fathers when they lose their children, that's the relationship pillar, that li their lives can just co collapse. And then their body pillar goes fairly shortly after that, their income pillar, because they cannot focus on work. And then their mind just collapses because out of this thinking about their children all the time, not being able to sleep, going on antidepressants, resorting to alcohol, collapses. So instead, we focus on strengthening those pillars, building deep roots, almost deep roots of a tree, that whatever storm that comes through of whatever is going to come through in life, that tree doesn't get ripped up or that chair doesn't just fall over. You've got resilience. So this is building resilience within your life. For many fathers, the spiritual pillar is also one of the pillars that just holds and almost, you know, if they're losing one of that, that still keeps their life up. And then the, the sixth pillar is adventure and story. And this is what kind of interesting man, what kind of gravitational force are you creating for your kids and for the future partners in your life is what have you been doing with your time when you don't have your kids? What kind of, you know, man are you becoming? So those, in a nutshell, are the, the six pillars. I, uh, yeah, I, I love the, the way you describe those. And it's, again, it, it's so simple. And everything that you're talking about is so simple, but it's so dramatically different than how most people approach divorce. And, and so different from how I think our cultural story and our legal system encourages people to approach it. You say it, and I'm like, well, yeah, that's perfectly clear. right? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh. And, and where we start with is the mind, which then connects to the body, which then, so the mind, and it's just simple little things that I get the fathers to do. And it's, I'll, I'll talk first, first on the body, and I'll show you how that ripples into other areas in life, just by going into your fridge and your cupboard. And for anyone who is watching this right now, go and do it right on pause of the video and go and do this, is look at everything in your cupboards and your fridges that your fridge that doesn't serve you and doesn't serve the type of man and father you're wanting to become in the future. Just by removing those foods, it might be cans of Coca-Cola, it might be alcohol, it might be sugars and sweets and, and whatever things, you will know what that is. That just gives you that five minutes of pleasure, but puts you into a state that doesn't have the energy and it does, it slowly puts this weight onto you, which literally slows you down, which then it's just this compounding effect within your life. So that simple action somebody watching this can do. Yeah. Secondly is just, there's so many other tools from journaling, which is such a beautiful way of getting all these thoughts that are in your mind onto paper and that can, is going to help you with your sleep. There's some beautiful breathing exercises and there's so many on the web on that. Some meditation. There are unbelievable amount of different things that the tying together between your mind and your body gives you the strength to be able to strengthen the relationship pillar. And then that, because you're in a better place and you're sleeping better, you're able to function better at work. So your income pillar gets strengthened. And then you're not so tired that you then decide to 
wake up early in the morning for those that are spiritual reading the, the Bible or do a yoga practice or med whatever it is for you, each of those strengths. And then you've got the energy to go on that hike, to come back, you know, to go and check out the trail to then next weekend when you do have your kids to show your kids that, you know, and you've then, so you see how everything is so interconnected here and it's a compounding effect that takes place in your life. That pillar model, it, it gives you, right, it's all so interconnected, but by breaking it down that way, now you do have these simple, simple things to do, right? There's the actions. And I, I think that piece is so important. A lot of the men I talk to, that's what they ask for. They're like, okay, I get this kind of big picture, but what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? And it sounds like part of what you're suggesting too is that not only are there concrete things you can do, but there's a lot of different ones that could work and it's really a matter of finding what it is for you that that feeds each of those pillars or supports each of them yeah, absolutely there, there is a simple tool that another tool to share with with the listeners of this call is go and get yourself a wall calendar where you've just got one entry per day and instead of using that to plan out the future things it's then a daily decision planning so am i going to go for a walk today am i going to go for a swim am i going to uh, go off to the gym? Am I going to read uh, uh, 10 pages of a, of a book? Am I going to meditate? Whatever it is, but you just make one positive decision for your life and put that down in your calendar every single day. And if you decide like it's a Sunday that you're going to rest, put that down. It's a conscious decision that you're going to rest. And this is then literally transforming what kind of man you're going to be in one year's time by these 365 actions that you can take within your life. I cannot tell you how transformative that can be within your life. And when your kids come around and anybody comes around, they're gonna see this in a prominent place. What is this on the wall here? What is this go for a, a run? And then, and then you can just see the graph going from, you know, just going for a one mile run to then five miles to then doing a, a quarter marathon, a marathon, cycling, swimming, uh, meditating, reading books, whatever it is for you literally will you will become a gravitational force for them and inspire them and you inspire your kids so much that can be done here <laughs> well, I, I love the wall calendar too because now you have a record right you can look back and be like wow look at all of these things that i have done uh, gary tell me uh, well and, and, and tell our viewers how can people work with you if, if somebody says yes i want i want this support i want 100k fathers um, what does it look like to to step in and do that work with you Absolutely. So if you go to my website, 100kfathers.com, uh, you can read um, a little bit of information there. And at the bottom is a form to be able to book a call. Go ahead and book a call um, with me and probably in the future, because as we're, we're getting to such a growth point now, there's so many fathers coming through. I probably wouldn't be taking that call, but you will get to see me inside of the community. And I do have programs, you know, one-on-one -on -one programs where it's an intensive eight-week program on top of the community and the group calls that take place and the fathers inside of this community. But I am also building out some self-guided programs as well. So that is probably the best way to actually go about getting hold of and having a conversation with me and finding out more. Perfect. Well, um, Gary, we'll have your website up here and also in the description um, so that people can find that easily and, and go and see what you're up to because Sounds like not just 100K fathers, but there's a lot developing a lot in the in the works because it sounds like you're finding that a lot of people need and, and want this work. Yep, absolutely. I mean, you can um, have put a few videos onto YouTube as well. There are some interviews and because it's so private, what I work with where fathers cannot talk private, private, you know, publicly and I cannot do these public interviews with them because often they're still going through time away from their kids that there's not public videos out there, but I am going to be adding some more interviews where I have interviewed like um, these two daughters that didn't get to see their father for the year and a half when they were teenagers. So there's one interview up there, but there's many more that I'm going to start adding onto that platform, onto, onto YouTube. Yeah, I mean, I, that piece I think could be so powerful, right, is to hear not just from the father, that would be amazing too, to hear from the fathers who've actually done this work and, and gotten this amazing new connection with their children, but yeah, what was it like for the kids? Yeah. Even what was it like for the ex-wife to see the change? And yeah, there's so much information that would be um, pretty powerful there. Absolutely. 
Gary, thank you so much. I think you know this kind of so simple, this mindset shift around child custody, around navigating divorce, dealing with your ex-wife. It's it's so simple, but I, I think it's so important that just step away from the fighting, focus on you, and really focus on creating um, a, a beautiful place for your children in your life and for your ex-wife as well um, as their mother. Absolute, absolute pleasure being here. And just for the fathers that are listening to this, just keep looking after yourself, just becoming a better man, honor your children by looking after yourself instead of honoring them by thinking going through court is going to be honoring them. So just keep, keep going in your own upward spiral is what, what I call this. Thank you, Rachel.